Welcome to BE112B Biomechanics, Biofluid and Cell Mechanics. As we already know, biomechanics is mechanics applied to biology, which is the interface of two large fields. So this quarter, our main focus is on the interface between continuum mechanics and its applications to blood flow in the circulation and the mechanics of cells. Applications of biofluid and cell mechanics include understanding changes in blood flow that occur in diseases, interpreting clinical measurements of blood flow, pressures, and pulse wave dynamics, the design of cardiovascular devices such as implantable valves, replacement vessels, and ventricular assist devices, and measuring changes in cell mechanical properties in diseases such as sickle cell anemia. On understanding how membrane dynamics and cell signaling are affected by mechanical forces acting on cells, and investigating cell mechanotransduction mechanisms involved in growth, differentiation, development, and disease. And finally, understanding and analyzing measurements from experimental techniques such as atomic force microscopy, traction force microscopy, and magnetic twisting rheometry. As a reminder, continuum mechanics is concerned with the mechanical behaviors of solids and fluids on a scale in which their physical properties, such as mass, momentum, and energy, can be defined by continuous functions. This requires that the scale of interest to be large compared with the dimensions of the discrete constituents of the material. This assumption then permits the densities of physical quantities to be defined as continuous functions of position in space. For example, the mass density rho is the limit as the volume element tends to zero of the mass of that volume element divided by its volume. This allows the governing equations of continuum mechanics to be written as partial differential equations. They involve key quantities such as stress, strain, and rate of deformation, which are tensors. The conservation laws of mass, momentum, and energy are universal to all continua but the constitutive law approximates the mechanical properties of particular materials. Recall that stress is a tensor that represents the forces of interaction acting across surfaces in a continuum. For example, for a uniaxial specimen of cross-sectional area A, subjected to tensile forces Fx along the axis of the specimen, the uniaxial stress sigma xx is fx divided by a. Sigma xx is a normal component of the Cauchy stress tensor and has units of force per area. Strain is a tensor that represents the changes of shape, i.e. length changes in a continuum. For example, if our uniaxial specimen that had been subjected to the tensile stresses in the previous example had an original length of L0, and after the application of the tensile stress had a new length of L0 plus delta L, then the strain epsilon xx is delta L over L0. And this is a normal component of the Cauchy strain tensor. It is dimensionless. Those were examples of normal stresses and strain. Let's look at examples of shear stress, shear strain, and shear rate. If the forces are applied tangent to a surface, here the forces F are applied in the x direction, but on the surfaces whose normal is the y direction. The shear stresses are the off-diagonal components of the stress tensor that arise from these tangent forces, and the shear stress tau yx in this example is F divided by A. Shear strains describe shape distortions that produce angle changes. For example, the displacement in the x direction ux is varying in this example as a function of y, and the shear strain epsilon xy is equal to one half of del ux del y, which is also equal to the half the tan of this angle theta. And tan theta is sometimes referred to as the engineering shear strain gamma. So the engineering shear strain gamma is two times the components of the Cauchy shear strain epsilon xy. In fluid flows, gradients of velocity give rise to the strain rate tensor. In this example, the strain rate component epsilon dot xy is one half of del vx del y, 
which is also one half of gamma dot, which is known as the strain rate. The constitutive law describes the mechanical properties of a material or class of material and gets its name because the mechanical properties of a material depend on its constituents. It's a mathematical relation for stress as a function of kinematic variables such as strain, strain rate, or both. It is also an idealization and an approximation, and it takes into account the microstructure of the material, in particular by defining the material symmetry of the material. The constitutive law must normally be determined with the aid of material testing of mechanical properties. And the validity of a constitutive law for a particular analysis depends not only on the material itself, but also on the mechanical conditions under which it is being analyzed. We classify continua as solids and fluids. Solids can support a shear stress indefinitely without flowing and assume an unloaded natural state. They can deform with minimal or significant energy dissipation, and they are commonly composites. Fluids are liquids or gases, where gases have a lower density and higher compressibility than liquids. They can support a hydrostatic pressure at rest, but they cannot support a shear stress without flowing. Fluids have no preferred natural shape, and they dissipate energy as heat when they flow. They are commonly mixtures. So some of the topics that we'll be studying in biofluid and cell biomechanics include flow kinematics, blood composition, rheology and flow, viscous and viscoelastic biofluids, the conservation of mass, momentum and energy for fluids, the Reynolds number and turbulent flows, Poisseur's solution for viscous flows in arteries and veins, Bernoulli's principle, which is conservation of energy in a fluid flow, blood pressure in the circulation and the effects of arterial branching, the effects of arterial and venous wall elasticity or distensibility, pulsatile flow in the circulation, microvascular flow and red blood cell deformability, cell membrane mechanics, cytoskeletal mechanics, including the filament systems in the cell, cytoplasmic viscoelasticity, and cell adhesion and traction forces, amongst other topics. So now I'll just give a brief preview of some of these topics so that you have some idea of what's ahead in this course. The viscosity of a fluid mu is the shear stress tau divided by the shear rate gamma dot. Viscosity is measured with a device called a viscometer. This is an example of a popular kind of viscometer known as a cone plate viscometer, where the fluid sample is, sits on a plate underneath a cone that spins. The spinning of the cone causes the fluid to shear, and the shear stresses in the fluid that are produced are transmitted from the cone to the plate, causing a torque to be measured at the stationary plate. From the torque, the stress can be computed, and from the speed of the cone, the shear rate can be computed. And thus, the viscosity can be measured. In whole blood, the viscosity isn't constant. So here we see the viscosity measured on a log scale relative to that of plasma, which is shown here as 1, as a function of the shear rate. And so what you can see is that as blood flows faster and the shear rate is higher, the apparent viscosity falls by over tenfold. The reason for this is mostly because at low shear rates and at rest, the blood cells aggregate into what are known as rouleaux. And as the blood starts to flow, the rouleaux start to break up and the viscosity of the blood decreases. Here you see the difference between the viscosity as a function of shear rate in whole blood and that in which albumin has been added, causing the cells not to aggregate. And you can see that when they don't aggregate, the viscosity is lower and changes less as a function of shear rate. But you notice that at high shear rates, both solutions still have a decreasing apparent viscosity. And that's because of the second property of whole blood, which is that the red blood cells are deformable. 
Here in this example, the red blood cells have been hardened, and you can see that that makes the viscosity higher and prevents the viscosity from decreasing with increasing shear rate. We will briefly discuss bioviscoelastic fluids, which can be measured with the viscometer, but also with specialized devices such as this extensional microreometer, which pulls a droplet of bioviscoelastic fluid out rapidly until it breaks. A common viscoelastic fluid that is studied in biology is mucus from different tissues. Here, for example, we see the storage and loss moduli of cervical mucus measured in a cone plate viscometer as it oscillated at different angular frequencies. We see that the pregnant women with a higher risk of preterm birth have lower storage and loss moduli at all frequencies than those at low risk. Let's briefly review the main conservation laws of fluid mechanics. First is the continuity equation, which is the Eulerian form of conservation of mass for a fluid. For example, at a branch in an arterial tree, if the flow into a branch is q dot naught, and the flow out of the branch in the two daughter branches is q1 dot and q2 dot, then the continuity equation gives rise to the constraint that q0 dot must equal q1 dot plus q2 dot. In other words, the flow coming in must equal the flow going out. The Navier-Stokes equations are conservation of linear momentum for a linear viscous or Newtonian fluid. Their terms include the transient inertial forces plus the convective inertial forces must equal minus the pressure gradient plus the viscous forces plus the body forces. Bernoulli's equation is conservation of energy for a fluid. For example, in a 1D flow, Bernoulli's equation says that rho v squared over 2 plus rho gz plus p is equal to constant. And this comes from conservation of energy that says that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done due to gravity plus the work done due to pressure. Or the change in kinetic energy equals minus the change in potential energy due to gravity plus the work done due to the pressure. Turbulence is a feature of flows that can also be seen in the circulation. Most flow in the circulation is laminar, but occasionally, such as downstream of stenosis, the flow can become turbulent. Another place where turbulent flows are observed are in the ventricles of the heart, and sometimes around the valves. The Reynolds number, nr, is a dimensionless number that reflects the ratio of the inertial forces in a flow to the viscous forces. It's computed from the density, viscosity, and characteristic velocity u and length scale l by the formula nr equals rho u l over mu. Turbulence occurs when the inertial forces get too high relative to the viscous forces, and the transitional Reynolds number above which flow transitions from laminar to turbulent flow is about 2300 in the circulation. We will also study blood flow in arteries and veins. For example, we'll derive Poisseur's law for tube flow, in which the flow rate q dot is equal to pi a to the fourth over 8 mu times delta p over l, where delta p is the difference between the inlet pressure PI and the outlet pressure PO. A is the radius of the tube, L is the length, and mu is the viscosity of the fluid. So the resistance to flow is the inverse of this term, namely 8 mu L over pi A to the fourth. Notice that as the diameter of a vessel decreases, the resistance increases as the fourth power of the diameter. Now Poisseur's law is derived for flow in a rigid tube, but blood vessels are not rigid. Their elasticity, amongst other things, allows the pressure pulse to propagate as a wave. So the pressure pulse wave in the arterial system has an amplitude of about 40 millimeters of mercury, uh, from a, the diastolic pressure of 80 millimeters to the systolic pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury. The mean pressure 
is the average of these, which can be computed from the area under the curve. One consequence of arterial elasticity is the pulse wave. So as the pressure changes in the blood vessel, the diameter changes as well. And this diameter change propagates along the arterial system as a pulse wave. Notice that the amplitude of the diameter pulse is much larger in a young subject than an old subject whose vessels are stiffer. Some important features of flow in the microcirculation include the fact that the microvessels are small, below 100 microns, and the velocities are slow because there are so many microvessels, with the result that the Reynolds number is much, much less than 1 and viscous forces dominate. Capillaries are permeable for mass transport, which means mass transport across the vessel wall must be accounted for in mass conservation in capillaries. The microvessels are comparable in scale to the size of the red blood cell, so whole blood cannot be considered homogeneous. It's inhomogeneous in the microcirculation. One unusual consequence of this inhomogeneity is that as the microvessel diameter decreases below about half a millimeter, you can see that the apparent viscosity actually decreases. This is known as the Ferreus Lindquist effect and has to do with the fact that the red blood cells travel faster than the plasma in the smallest vessels. Finally, the capillaries are smaller in diameter than the erythrocytes. So in capillary flow, the ability of the red blood cells to deform is important for them to get through the smallest microvessels. So here you can see the red blood cells deforming in order to squeeze through the smallest capillaries. We will study cell mechanics at the whole cell and subcellular scales, including the contributions of major structural components, such as the cell membrane, cytoskeletal filaments, and cytoplasm. Here, for example, we see a micropipette aspiration experiment designed to measure the mechanical properties of the cell wall by aspirating part of the cell membrane into the micropipette and measuring the displacement of the cell into the micropipette as a function of the suction pressure. Another popular cell mechanics technique for studying whole cell mechanics is called traction force microscopy. Here, the cell is grown on or in a gel that has embedded fluorescent beads in it, shown here in purple. By tracking the motion of the beads as the cell contracts and deforms the gel, the traction forces that the cell imposes on the surrounding gel can be computed, as shown here. In a variation on this approach, cells can also be grown on microfabricated polymer post arrays, here seen under electron microscopy, uh, for an endothelial cell. And you can see that as the endothelial cell has contracted, it has bent the posts on which it's growing. And based on the diameter of the posts, the length and elastic properties, the forces that the cell imposed on the substrate to deform the posts can be computed. Some approaches to subcellular micromechanics that we will study include optical or magnetic tweezer methods for applying forces to small microspheres on or inside the cell using magnetic beads to apply a twisting force to the membrane, using atomic force microscopy to apply indentation forces along the surface of a cell, or using optical imaging of single particles in or on the cell as they undergo thermal fluctuations or Brownian motion. So that gives you a brief overview of some of the main topics that we'll cover this quarter. I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions about this, and some of them will probably have to wait until we get to these topics, but we'll discuss these questions in class.